Welcome, everybody, back to LearnPianoLive.com. My name is Jamin, and special guest this week in from New York uh, with multiple downbeat awards and l awards from all kinds of initials that uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know if you're a jazz nerd. Uh, this is Carl Stab now, not only a great saxophonist, but the guy with the most awesome last name in the world. Carl, <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks so much for having me out here. Um, so, and you probably recognize Levy there too, who's been with us uh, for a, a couple of lessons here. Uh, so, what we're doing here is a Q and A. Uh, Carl, I wanted you to tell us about the uh, group that that you uh, head up and and how you arrange and stuff like that. Uh, I got a bunch of questions from uh, people who sent in questions ahead of time, and then uh, if you want to, if you guys want at home, want to fire off your questions in the chat room, then uh, by putting your name and your question in the box below this video, we'll get to as many of those as we can cram in uh, with the, the short time here that Carl has with us. So, uh, Carl, would you first tell us about uh, your group? You, you do, uh, you arrange without a piano. You want to talk mm -hmm. to us about <coughs> kind of the role of, of the piano and, and how right, you do what you right. do. Well, you know, if you, if you are unlucky enough to hear me play piano, you'll <laughs> probably realize why I don't play piano. Um, don't <laughs> arrange for it. Um, and actually, no, it came more out of, um, you know, I play the baritone saxophone. And historically, one of the great um, baritone saxophone players is Jerry Mulligan. For those of you who are from California or from listening um, here, you'll recognize the name. Um, he was a West Coast favorite um, 
got his start back in the 30s. Um, but his quartet, uh, he would arrange for uh, a baritone saxophone and either um, you know, some kind of second voice, but there was never any bass, uh, or there's never any piano, there's bass and drums. So the idea of this pianoless quartet came out of what they refer to as you know, more of a West Coast style of playing. Um, so that's kind of how I got my start with this and thought it would be a great opportunity to get to um, explore some different ways you can look at harmony, um, different ways you can look at melody and interaction within a group of all single line instruments. Cool. So you had, you had talked to us about, uh, I guess, some of the advantages and disadvantages of having a piano in your group. What do you mm -hmm. like and, and what do you sometimes miss? Advantage-wise, um, it's, it's really great to get to play with um, pianists who have a really good understanding of harmony. I'm always surprised by a lot of the guys that I'm fortunate enough to play with. Um, some of the things that they come up with, and they'll, they'll stretch me harmonically, um, they'll stretch my ear, they'll kind of stretch me in terms of, you know, what I'd come up with creatively, which is always nice. Um, one of the limitations of piano, though, um, which actually has nothing to do with the piano player, is just the size. And playing in a lot of smaller clubs, a lot of club owners are hesitant, saying, well, you're going to bring a piano in. That doesn't really fit in our club. Or um, you'll, you'll get a... a you know, finding that pianos are just hard to come by in clubs these days, right. especially ones that actually sound good. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, one of the limitations of it. Um, but as far as, you know, playing limitations, um, I, as a single um, line improviser, I think it's, it's good for everyone to learn how to have an understanding of harmony without having, you know, every single note in the chord at your fingertips. Basically picking and choosing, you know, what's important to outline what you want to play. Right, so basically uh, the way that we would solo then, or w what we would work on for soloing is just what you're doing the entire time of outlining chords. And, right, um, right. So you, do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, what, what are your pet peeves as far as what pianists do that, you, that are helpful to you? Mm -hmm. What is more importantly, <laughs> perhaps, what's detrimental to you as a saxophone player? Sure. Um, as as far as the pianists that I play with, some of the things that I look for in a really good pianist um, are a really good ear and awareness of who's playing in the group. Um, and a lot of times I'll play in a group where you know, I'm on baritone saxophone and there'll be, for example, a trumpet player or an alto saxophone player. Um, and one of the things that I think is important for pianists to be aware of is that all of these different instruments have different um, timbral characteristics and different ranges that they play in. And Levy and I were actually just talking about this morning. Um, where if you're in a group and you're playing piano behind a lower instrument and you're used to comping in that middle range or in the lower range, right. you're going to find that a lot of the stuff that you play is going to cover up lower instruments like bass and baritone saxophone and uh, trombone or if you're lucky enough to have a tuba in your group. Um, some of those uh, Dixieland types of things. You, you know, the piano will actually cover up those instruments playing. Um, so one of the things that I look for in a pianist to hire is when you find a different soloist playing, especially a lower voice, do you move to maybe comping in the higher register? Um, and I found that's actually you know, a specialized skill for pianists and it's good to work on because your harmonies up in the higher register of the instrument are going to sound a little bit different. Right. So then uh, would you say that if there's no bass player and there is a barrier there that we treat you like the bass player as far as what we stay away from or what, in what ways are you different from a bass? Well, you know, bass... Um, you know, other than the fact that generally I'm not walking a bass line the whole time other than when I'm playing duo. Uh, as far as in a combo setting, I would just say be, be mindful that, yeah, it's a saxophone, it's going to be loud, it's going to you know, have presence, but there are going to be certain nuances and certain things that get lost if you're you know, covering up over top of it. Right. Okay, well, let's jump into some of these questions because we got a, a lot of them, probably more than we'll be able to get to. Um, in, uh, in what ways are saxophones better off for knowing piano or vice versa? Mm, okay. Um, I would be a whole lot better off if I was able to play piano a little better. Um, what, I, what I like about piano, and I, I do make a point of studying it and of playing it, um, is the idea of connecting voices to each other. Um, and I talked a little bit about the idea of having like a single voice if you're a saxophone player or a trumpet mm -hmm. player. You know, you're working with one melody line. Um, but I think one of the advantages is that you really have an idea of what notes resolve where if you play piano. Um, you know, you're working with, you know, sometimes three, four, five, six different voices at once. You know, in each one of those voices, it matters how you resolve it. And that's a weakness that I hear a lot in single line horn players, saxophones, you know, right. going back to that whole thing, is that a lot of saxophonists have what I call 
uncontrolled chromaticism is they'll <laughs> land on a note and they just they won't know where to go for uh, you know from it or they won't have an idea of how to resolve a note. I think that's a strength that comes from you know having a good solid understanding of a keyboard. Right. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah, because we're always talking about, uh, sorry, I, I was telling if I, trying to decide if I want to move on here or not, but uh, we're always talking about wanting to play or think like a horn player. So we're always the opposite mm -hmm. way of just, you know, d don't be a pianist, be a, a sax player. Um, so you're saying that uh, when, you're, when you're playing and you can, if you can think like a pianist or um, learn piano, then that, that's going to help you resolve your lines am i hearing that right yeah I've, I've i've found that having a good knowledge of how notes are supposed to move within a chord is is just a kind of a basic understanding that everybody can always work on so can you give me an example of like a, a bad uh like something you would do if you didn't have a good um understanding of the harmonies that you're talking about um i'm trying to think i i this is you know becoming more and more subconscious to me as i play right um what i notice it a lot in is you know, I'll find like on major chords, for example, someone will be um, on the fifth of the chord and they'll resolve it down to the fourth. And that tends to be a, you know, a common note a lot of beginning improvisers will end up landing on. You know, if you're, right. if you're a keyboard player, you know that those really you know, don't tend to move as well. So you, you, know, you have an understanding of what notes stay stationary, what notes move, because it's actually in your fingers. You know, we don't really get the luxury of getting cool. to see what notes move. Right. There's a visualization process that happens. It's a little bit different when you're playing a keyboard. Right. Levy, do you, do you have anything to add on that one? Um, is the mic on? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. There we go. <laughs> All right. Got it. Um, yeah, so like what Carl was saying, um, it really helps uh, to play the keyboard because you can um, really, uh, advanced horn players can understand the harmony and the way things should resolve, but when you play it on a keyboard, you can really see how it, it all works. Right. Um, and so playing keyboard really helped my playing um, in terms of how things resolve and alterations that you can do to certain chords just because I know what it looks like and feels like on the keyboard. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Cool. Next one is, uh, what's the difference between a berry player and, alt or, and an alto or tenor player? Uh, about 30 minutes in the dryer twice a week. <laughs> the horn shrinks. No. Um, difference is, it has to do with that, with that sound um, and where it, where it lays on top of the piano. Um, you know, if you were to look at it in terms of range on a keyboard. Um, really good berry players, really good alto players, there's not much of a difference between them other than that sound. And that's just a matter of, you know, being aware of where they rest in the range. So, but you consider yourself a, a berry player, mm -hmm. right? Right. So why do you, why do you not consider yourself a, a t I mean, what, what's the difference? If you're saying it's just the the timbre of the, is there anything different in the way that you think about your solos or your role or anything like that? Right. Um, I hear things a little bit lower and I found <laughs> that, yeah, and Levy can, Levy can attest to this, is, um, you know, my whole uh, concept of, of listening and hearing, and I do a lot of singing, um, and that's something that I stress for a lot of students is the importance of, of singing what you're going to, you know, improvise on or right. singing what you're going to play on. Yep. But I tend to, by, in my By the head, way, sorry, for all the oh, yeah. students, I, I didn't pay him to say that ahead of time. <laughs> that was actually just his thought. No, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big deal to me. Um, a lot of my practice is just singing. Um, and no, I'm not a paid, I'm not a paid actor. <laughs> so, you know, going back to that idea is a lot of what I hear is lower. I sing in a lower range and, you know, not... Not all guys who sing low play Barry. You know, there's a lot of you know, it's it's a very personal I don't have thing. Have an alto range. <laughs> um, yeah, but getting back to that, it's uh, it's it's more of you know a, a sound preference to me. It's it's where right. I hear the music happening. Hmm. Okay, cool. Um, would you say that you got that before or after you started playing Barry, or was there like an, a musical influence or like? Did you come into it and find out, oh, I'm always hearing this stuff down here? Or when you heard that, was like, oh, that's what I want to start hearing? Well, I was always adventurous. And I started on alto. Um, and then I saw tenor. And I was like, well, that looks cool. It's a bigger instrument. And I'm a, I'm a guy. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> tall. I should play that. And then I got older. And I'm like, well, I'm even taller now. And there's a bigger saxophone. So I guess I should try that. And really? Seriously? Uh, yeah, really seriously. What? Wow. And uh, there were, I, 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 I was that. fortunate to have great parents who had um, a very wide... Uh, selection of, of music available from jazz to country to you know old-time rock and things like that um, 
you know, if I would say there was an influence, yeah, they had, they had um, uh, you know, jazz CDs with baritone saxophonists. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the Motown was actually really heavily influenced, and if you listen to some of those great old Motown songs, there's right. a Barry solo in most of them, so right. at least it seems like that. Cool. Um, what's your number one musical goal? My number one musical goal. I don't know how you're going to interpret Let's that. Let's see. <laughs> um, well, it was to win a downbeat. <laughs> All right. Uh, when I was in high school, that was, that was one. Thank you. you die a no, happy man. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. You've made no, it's, it's, always, it's always to be, um, I've, I've wanted to win a Grammy for a long time. Um, you know, I've, I have been fortunate to have people around me who've supported me um, in my musical studies. Um, you know, to really show me how to make a living playing music. Mm -hmm. um, but some of those, some of those things, uh, you know, the awards and things that are out there, the recognition for that, um, yeah, a, a Grammy would be, you know, one of my, one of my top goals. Um, you know, extrinsically, intrinsically, it's to always be a student of the music. And I think that's, that's kind of what stays at the forefront, is right. I always want to be in a position where I'm learning something. Yeah. So. Uh, all right. Well, speaking of uh, another one of the questions is what is it that you're working on right now? So when you when you get to your level, mm -hmm. is it just generally like you just become more and more of a god, or <laughs> are there specific things that you work on? It's it's specific, and I found that as I've gotten older, my practice time has gotten more more precious to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of it, part of it has been learning how to practice, and what I've realized is important not just for saxophonists but for anybody um, is when I go to practice, I need to define my goals. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, what are my goals? And right. my first goal is to have really well-defined goals for what I want to be able to do. <laughs> That's it, sorry, um, the cheater answer. I know, but as, as far as how I get there, um, you know, I think another important thing is putting constraints on your playing. Um, like I'll go into work on soloing and I'll decide, uh, I'm gonna play on this certain tune and I'm gonna work on you know, playing just uh, you know, only with the rhythm of a triplet. Mm -hmm. or only a certain interval, and I know that stretches me um, as a player. That's something I'm working on. You know, just for my development, um, technically, on the horn. Um, mm -hmm. As far as other things I work on, you know, getting back to this idea of pianoist quartet or working with a single melody line mm -hmm. is really studying and learning um, how to be more effective in that. Right. So these all sound really general. Is there anything... Like specific, like I really suck at the key of D flat, for example, is like something that we would do, you know, we'd be working on right now right. on piano. Is there anything like specific that is, or, or has at least been recent for you? Or? Recently, um, it's been kind of two, two, two goals going on at once. One of them has been um, transcribing, transcribing a lot of um, the Jerry Mulligan lines that he plays. He was a master of composition in playing, so that's kind of like the one section of my playing, and that gets me thinking compositionally, it gets me thinking harmonically. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of my playing is getting into the idea of pentatonic patterns and manipulation of those. Um, I find my world tends to be split between um, this kind of 1950s West Coast cool sound and the uh, more modern shredding pentatonics as you play. So you kind of can't get away from that as a saxophonist. All right. <coughs> uh, one more, and then we'll go into our uh, lightning round here because we're running short on time. Uh, but we've been talking recently about uh, practice routine and uh, how to avoid bad habits and mm -hmm. how to set up that time and actually get into it. Uh, any suggestions, recommendations for uh, just general musicians, practice time, ready, mm -hmm. set, go? Um, I found I do best when I practice in the morning. So my suggestion, everybody's different, is figure out when, figure out when you're most awake and when you're most, you know, um, receptive to learning. You'd be surprised that, you know, if you're not really, if you're, if you're making the time, um, you know, forcing it to happen, it's, you're going to be more productive if you find some time when you're actually, you know, really going with things. But as far as setting up my practice time um, and things that I generally like to do with that, practice slow, um, practice with a metronome, um, those are all things that I've found. Actually, as I've gotten older, I've practiced slower and slower and slower. Because? Um, it generates good technique. It generates um, even playing. It generates even sound, you know, when I work on my sound concept. Um, it generates... Um, you know, confidence in what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I'd be embarrassed sometimes if people walk by, you know, I'm practicing and you're going, wow, right. I can't tell what he's playing, it's so slow. Right. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really about 
making every note as well defined um, as it can be because you know every note that we play is important. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, all right, so this is then the lightning round where we're just gonna hit the, as many as we, of these as we can. All right. Let's say like 10 seconds per, per answer if we can. You got it. Uh, what's the most useful degree to get to make a living playing music? Uh, education degree. Music education. Music education. Uh, why is it that uh, all, all great performers seem like they're also teaching private lessons? Ten seconds. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of us really, really actually like to teach. Um, a lot of us, uh, depends on where you are in the country, if there's a lot of gigs available, there right. you need to have other sources of income. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's consistent income. Exactly. Uh, um, yeah. uh, what musical advice impacted you most? Uh... Listen lots. To what you're playing, to others, to To what? everything. Listen to yourself, listen to other people, listen to records, expose yourself to as much as you can, as often as you can, and sing. Sing with it, learn it, so you have it in, in, you know, completely internalized. It will come out. All right. Favorite gig ever? Uh, actually, it was with Levy, playing in uh, Perugia, Italy, at the uh, Umbria Jazz Whoa. Festival. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, what made it motivated you to practice when you started out? I'm very competitive, <laughs> very competitive, and, and Levy will tell you that. Um, competitive, and it was something I enjoyed doing. So you put those two together, it's a dangerous combination. Right. Uh, who is your biggest in-person influence? So per person you've met, or a teacher of yours? Uh, Jose Encarnacion, he was a saxophone uh, professor of mine. Ended up teaching at Eastman for a couple of years while I was there. Levy had him um, as well. Nobody that I know has loved the music and his students more than him. Yeah, he teaches at Lawrence mm -hmm. now. Currently there. Great school. Cool. Uh, what are the most important three albums to own? Ooh. Ten seconds, go. <laughs> Ten seconds. I'd say Kind of Blue. Uh -huh. I would say... Miles Davis. Yep. Uh, Ellington at Newport. Yeah. And Duke Ellington. Yep, Duke Ellington. Well, I'm a baritone saxophone player, so anything Jerry Mulligan... I, I won't. I won't confine on that one. But you know, I'll, I'll say the third after those two is, is pretty much up to the discretion of the All right. player. Levy, ten seconds. Go. Oh, that same question. Yeah, same question. Okay, not the same three albums. No. Oh, okay. Um, uh, any of the Ella sings whatever songbook mm -hmm. um, is an important one. Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald. Um, I'm changing my third answer. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I'm gonna go with vocalists. Actually, Mel Torme sings Fred Astaire. Um, and then, ooh, uh, third drawn, uh-oh, big blank. Um, for contemporary writing, I would say Maria Schneider, Concert in the Garden. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what's the difference between a musical hobbyist and a real musician? What makes a r real musician? How you approach, how you play. Um, the, the the mindset that you have going into it. Um, if you are focused and dedicated to it, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there needs to be a lot of amateur, you know, players out there. Just because you're not playing gigs all the time doesn't, you know, in my mind necessarily mean that you're an amateur player. I've heard a lot of great people out there who don't play for lots of money who, who you know, are, are incredible players. Mm -hmm. It's about the mindset that you come into it with. Okay. How long does it take to get good? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on your goals. It depends on what you define as good. Um, some people are some people are you know happy being able to be good enough to play in a, in a, in a band, uh, and if that's your goal and if that's what you want to get to, it, you know it doesn't have to take long. You know you define what you think is good. Five, and work five for years, it. one year. <laughs> for, uh, for me, probably twenty more years. But um, <laughs> I'd say I'd say if, with 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 intense focus practice, you can get pretty good in a year or two. At what, what's intense? Uh, give, give us an idea of how much you practice or have practiced in the past. Um, I, had a, I had a teacher in undergrad who was a great saxophonist, Walt Weisskopf, and he, he said you shouldn't have to practice more than two hours a day, five days a week. But you should you know, set goals for yourself, be dedicated to it, and not waste your time. Wow. Yeah. Okay, you shouldn't have to practice more than two hours a day. It's his philosophy. It's worked yeah. for me so far. So. Okay. Cool. Uh, Levy, did you, did you, were you wanting to throw something in at the beginning of that one? Um, I forget. Okay. I, I, the question was, what's the difference between a musical hobbyist and a real musician? Um, no. Okay. Nothing. 
<laughs> all right, cool. Well, uh, that, I, that's all we got time for. Um, I think we pretty much wrapped up the rest of the questions and the others. There's some uh, re repetition in here. So um, if you guys want to walk us out with uh, some favorite tune of yours. Well, favorite. favorite we'll yeah. do favorite. Seems to be the favorite. All right. All right. Thanks again, guys. Uh, Carl, where can they find your uh, stuff? Uh, you can check out my website. It's www.carlstabnowjazz, all one word, .com. Cool. We'll put a big fat link to that at, on our blog. And uh, thanks again, guys, for joining us. And for all of you at home, uh, next week we're doing the blues. So join us Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're switching our time to noon. So join us at noon. Uh, that's noon in California, which applies to almost none of you. <laughs> but uh, anyway, go, go on the Internet. Find out what time that is for you. Um, I know you people in uh, Russia and, and Japan will love me for that. So you're welcome, and see you soon. Thanks.